Hello and uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Peter Ashley with HUD's Office of Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes. And I'd like to welcome you to our fourth in a series of uh, Healthy Homes seminars. Uh, today we're going to be looking at uh, the home environment and asthma. And we have a great panel, so please uh, stay for the, for the whole webcast and for you folks in the, in the room, uh, please stick around. Um, I just wanted to give a little context to uh, my office and how uh, we've, our connection with this topic over the years. Uh, we started our, our Healthy Homes Initiative in uh, 99, and just uh, from the beginning, we had uh, grants uh, that we uh, referred to as Healthy Homes Demonstration Grants. Um, and we uh, offered those uh, over the years, probably not every year in this range that I'm showing, but uh, most of these years. And, uh, they weren't prescriptive. Uh, they, they, we, left the, uh, we let the applicant uh, decide what they were going to do with these grants in terms of home interventions, uh, what uh, they were going to focus on. We asked them to evaluate uh, the impact of their interventions. But a lot of them, not surprisingly, did focus on uh, asthma interventions. Uh, our lead hazard control grants uh, address lead, so we, we asked the uh, grantees uh, not to address lead hazards. And some of them published. I have a, a couple of them um, up here on the slide. Uh, one of them um, did some work in public housing in Seattle, and they noted that uh, children with asthma moving into new uh, public housing built using green specs showed uh, significant improvements in their symptoms. Um, and then we had for a few years uh, what we call Healthy Homes Production Grants, and they were more similar to our lead hazard control grants in which the uh, the grantees identified uh, significant hazards in the, in the homes uh, comprehensively and then intervened. But a lot of these also um, address homes of uh, children with poorly controlled asthma. Um, this other category, uh, asthma interventions in public and assisted uh, multifamily housing, was kind of an experiment. We offered these for two years. Two of our speakers today will talk about uh, grants that they implemented from this category. And they... Uh, funded interventions in public or multifamily housing, assi federally assisted multifamily, but I think all of them ended up working in public housing with one working in tribal housing. Uh, so Dr. Sandell and um, Helen uh, Margellis will, will talk about these, uh, their work on these grants today. And um, the final category, uh, Healthy Homes Technical Studies grants are the research grants that we funded since the start of the program. Uh, again, I think there's maybe a couple years where we didn't offer them in this range, uh, this period, but uh, most of the years we have. And um, again, these are, these are open to uh, the researchers addressing uh, a wide range of uh, housing-related health hazards, uh, the goal of improving assessment and control methods. But again, a lot of our applications over the years have been uh, asthma-focused. Um, and our uh, speakers today will, will talk about some of these uh, technical studies grants. Just a couple I wanted to mention. Uh, we've got one in Massachusetts that Dr. Sandel will talk about um, uh, in which they're looking at the impact of um, uh, community health worker-led interventions in the homes of uh, low-income um, low income homes with, uh, of kids with poorly controlled asthma. And then uh, there's, there's one that's a uh, similar theme in, in Maryland. Uh, I know Dr. Matsui is uh, involved in that uh, as a consultant. Um, the one in Massachusetts should be done soon. Uh, Maryland's a little farther behind that. Um, and then we've got one um, that Helen uh, Margellis will talk about um, that's looking at um, longer-term benefits of uh, home interventions. Uh, these are just uh, these are some of the papers that have been published uh, coming out of these. Uh, the first two are technical studies uh, grants. Uh, the bottom one is actually interagency uh, funding uh, from us to EPA. Uh, the, the top one was kind of interesting. They, they used our uh, technical studies funds uh, to supplement a longitudinal study funded by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. It looked at the development of asthma in uh, infants uh, recruited as, as infants uh, or even uh, prenatally and followed over time, and they used our funds to uh, do more exposure assessment. And they found that uh, uh, this um, assessment using this particular index, uh, looking at mold exposure during the first year of life, 
was the only environmental exposure that was predictive of asthma at uh, age seven years. So that was uh, uh, kind of an interesting uh, study and I think quite useful. Um, so I just wanted to mention some other major activities that, um, that are happening at HUD that, that maybe aren't specifically asthma focused, all of them, but we expect to uh, help um, children and adults with asthma uh, living in uh, HUD assisted housing. So the first one is, is asthma focused and it's, uh, we've been sponsoring along with the EPA and uh, CDC what we've been calling asthma summits around the country to uh, promote the idea uh, the value of, um, of uh, reimbursing for in-home interventions in homes of kids with poorly controlled asthma, again, uh, trying to get the, the right players to the table, Medicaid, local um, uh, managed care organizations, et cetera, uh, just to get possibly get the ball rolling in that uh, community uh, on this topic. Um, and then um, a couple of other initiatives at HUD, uh, my office is promoting integrated pest management training in public housing, a stop pest uh, program. Um, and then um, HUD has had a uh, smoke-free housing initiative since 2009. Uh, the department put out a proposed rule that would ban smoking in public housing. Uh, and uh, that comments were due in January and the department's now working on a, a final rule. Uh, this is the uh, web page for the stop pest program. Again, that's uh, sponsoring training for uh, public housing uh, managers uh, and staff and also uh, federally assisted housing on implementing, implementing integrated pest management. Uh, this um, is an editorial from the Boston Globe from 2013 uh, that noted a reduction in uh, asthma among adults in uh, Boston public housing. They were able to measure this um, I think it was from a period of uh, 2008 to 2012, and they happen to have a local survey that allows them to, um, to uh, measure this over, over the years. And uh, you can attribute it, attribute it definitely to their improved pest control, but it's certainly uh, plausible that that was contributing. And I think uh, Megan's going to talk a little bit about that today. And then this is the uh, federal plan to reduce asthma disparities. HUD's a, a major player in implementing that. Those asthma summits that I mentioned are a key activity under this uh, federal plan. Um, we're, we're taking questions during the webcast. Uh, is that right, Rachel Riley? Yes, we are taking questions. So if you have any questions, uh, please send them to leadregulations at uh, hud.gov. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker today. Um, that is Dr. Elizabeth Matsui. Um, Dr. Matsui is a professor of pediatrics, epidemiology, and environmental health sciences at Johns Hopkins University. She has deep experience in the clinical investigation of home allergen and pollutant exposure and asthma and allergic disease and is a board certified and practicing pediatric allergist and immunologist. She holds a master's in epidemiology and has more than 10 years of experience directing a, a data management, management and analysis core that is rep responsible for statistical analysis of studies related to environmental exposures and allergic diseases. Elizabeth is currently serving as the PI of two randomized controlled trials of home environmental interventions in childhood asthma and an observational study of the effect of moving to lower poverty neighborhoods on home exposures and asthma. Uh, for some of you who know about uh, the HUD-sponsored Moving to Opportunity study, um, it, has the, it, it was a study that looked at uh, the impact of moving inner city uh, residents to areas of greater opportunity. So this um, study that um, I just mentioned that Elizabeth's the PI of has a, has a similar theme. So with that, let me get out of the way and, and uh, bring up Elizabeth. Thank you so much. It's, it's um, exciting to be invited and to speak, um, and especially to speak to an, an audience that um, is, is enthusiastic about um, advocating for child health in, in, in terms of home environments. Um, so today I'm going to focus the first half of, of my talk on 
kind of where we are and what we know about indoor environments and childhood asthma. And then I'm going to focus the second half on what I think the challenges are for our communities and, and, and stakeholders in healthy housing in terms of trying to uh, move the needle on housing interventions and childhood asthma. So a little bit of background. I think um, there's all sorts of housing across all sorts of populations that can be unhealthy. A lot of our focus, however, has been on low-income urban minority populations. And the reason for that uh, is really indicated in this slide. So you can see that asthma hospitalizations are much higher among blacks than among non-blacks, and that this disparity has persisted over time and in fact has grown in some ways as hospitalizations have decreased among non-blacks. And we know that at least in inner cities, which are low-income urban neighborhoods, that racial and ethnic minorities are the predominant population there. And we know also that there's a striking disparity in asthma prevalence, so that national prevalence among children is about 10 percent, and asthma prevalence in inner city communities is as high as 25 to 28 percent. So in terms of thinking about whether living in an inner city in and of itself is a risk factor for morbidity, um, it is. And I, I show you here in this slide what you see are, are odds ratios, which is basically the risk of uh, being hospitalized, for example, which is the last um, figure, last data point on the right, the risk of being hospitalized for inner city children compared to non-inner city children. And the interpretation here is that inner city children, after accounting for race, have a 60% greater risk of being hospitalized for asthma, a 40% greater risk of having an emergency department visit for asthma, and a very small increased risk of having an outpatient visit for asthma. And there are many features of inner city environments that, that likely contribute to this. And so I mentioned a few on the slide, low health literacy, stress, poor access to transportation, financial obstacles. There are many, many more. Um, but the one that has kind of stood out time and time again um, in studies over the past many decades are the environmental exposures that are associated with inner city housing. And why is this? And I show you here some pictures of some Baltimore homes. Now, Baltimore does have some distinctive housing in, in that what you see are row homes, but what this is common for other inner city areas, some of these features. And so one of the things you can see is that there is occupied housing that's in between vacant housing. And the vacant housing offers lots of opportunity for, for pests to hang out and then also enter um, the occupied home. And on the bottom, you see two pictures of holes and cracks that are indoors, and these are places where pests can enter housing. And there are more problems than just pests in inner city homes, but I just highlight the, kind of this aspect of, of inner city housing here, but we'll talk about indoor pollutants as well. So th really, the evidence has been pretty strong over a long period of time that pest allergen exposure is associated with a significant asthma morbidity. Uh, the green bar in the slide sh demonstrates the hospitalization risk among those who are both sensitized and exposed to cockroach allergen compared to everybody else. So there's a markedly increased risk of being hospitalized for asthma among inner city children who are allergic to cockroach and exposed to high levels of the allergen in their homes. We find similar uh, results with mouse allergens. So the mouse allergen story has kind of unfolded more recently. So children who are mouse allergic and have high levels of mouse allergen in their home have a 50% greater risk of having an acute visit for asthma and about a 50% greater risk of having problems with lung function. That's what you see is labeled as reversibility there. So their lungs are directly affected by uh, our measurements of lung function, and they are at much greater risk of having an acute visit. Um, and there's a huge risk for hospitalization. In this one particular study, there were 10 hospitalizations over the course of follow-up, and nine of these hospitalizations occurred in children who were both mouse sensitized and exposed. So the past allergen story um, is a compelling one. 
We also know that there are non-allergen exposures in the indoors. So one of them is particulate matter exposure. So particulate matter exposure, I like to explain to patients actually that we are breathing in particles that we don't see. So that's airborne particulate matter. Um, it's here in this room. It's here wherever the audience is um, who's listening and watching the webinar. Um, but in inner city homes, the indoor PM, particulate matter concentrations, tend to be higher than they are outdoor. So they are often higher than what the EPA regulates or sets as a, as a healthy standard or a, a standard that uh, we need to achieve for outdoor PM. And the main contribution to indoor PM is secondhand smoke exposure, cigarette smoke. Um, so we know that the indoor PM is much higher in homes where there's a smoker. And among children with asthma living in inner city neighborhoods, higher indoor particulate matter is associated with more symptoms. So they have 6% more days of cough and wheeze and chest tightness symptoms. So that adds up over a year, over 365 days, 8% more days where they've had to slow down because of their asthma, um, and 11% more days where their speech is limited because their asthma is so severe. So there's clearly an association between indoor particulate matter exposure, much of which is related to uh, cigarette smoke in the home, and asthma symptoms. There are also non-particulate or gaseous pollutants. And so the most common one or the, and the one that's most well studied that's indoors is nitrogen dioxide. Nitrogen dioxide is a combustion byproduct. Um, so it's present in higher concentrations in homes where there are gas stoves and gas heat. And it's a resp known respiratory irritant. And again, you see that for every 20 part per billion increase in nitrogen dioxide, and what we, we typically see half the homes have more than 20 parts per billion in many inner city communities. So for every 20 part per billion increase, there's an increase in the days of symptoms. And in some inner city communities, so certainly in Detroit and Baltimore, gas as a source of fuel for stoves and heat uh, is very common, so probably in about 75 to 85 percent of homes. So we now have a story of allergen exposure. About half to two-thirds of the kids are allergic to those allergens they're exposed to. We have PM exposure. We have about half of the kids live with a smoker in the home, so they have higher PM exposure. And then more than three-quarters of the home have gas stoves. So we've got a kind of piling on of um, exposures that cause inflammation and, and lung disease. So what are the key questions? So what is the evidence? So can we reduce the exposures? And, and one of the real challenges of, of working in the field of environmental health is that coming at this from a physician perspective, I have colleagues who do drug development. Um, their question when they, when they need to develop a drug is, does, does the drug reduce asthma morbidity or does it uh, address or improve a particular health outcome. We have to show that we can reduce exposures and that as a result of that, that the disease improves. And so these are the two key questions, and this is work that's been going on uh, by some of the other speakers and has been going on for 20 years or more. So I'm going to go through kind of each of these exposures and talk to you about the evidence that we can reduce it. So one is secondhand smoke exposure, and one caveat here is that um, a very, there's a whole critically important field of secondhand smoke exposure reduction that addresses and is, is trying to understand how to, how to encourage families to institute home smoking bans and how to work towards smoking cessation. And that is clearly the number one goal. Short of that, because it's often difficult to achieve, and many of the families we work with don't, are not the homeowner or the head of the household, so they don't have control. They're not the smoker, but they don't have an opportunity to live in another kind of environment. So we have done, and another group has done, um, a randomized control trial of two HEPA-like air purifiers in homes of smoke, of children who live with smokers, and the children all have asthma. And we do know now in two randomized control trials that, that placement of these two HEPA air purifiers reduces indoor PM concentrations by about 25 to 50 percent. And one trial found that, the, that being assigned to get the air purifiers reduced exacerbations, and another trial found that there was a reduction in the number of symptom days that the um, 
children had who received the air purifiers. So I think we have pretty good evidence that we can get about a 25 to 50 percent reduction in these air purifiers. And we have good evidence that that's associated with, with a health effect. So what about nitrogen dioxide, which I mentioned? Um, this was a study that was sponsored by HUD that was done by a colleague of mine. Um, and it was a study in which um, gas stoves were replaced with electric stoves. There were three different arms. So there was stove replacement. There was placement of an air purifier. And I want to say something very important here, that the commercially available air purifiers do not reduce gaseous pollutants. This was an air purifier that we worked with the company to design and add extra carbon in the air purifier so that it was designed to try to reduce an O2. And then a vent ventilation hood, because the idea is if you can have a, most of these homes did not have an operating ventilation hood over the stove. And, and what my colleagues found was that there was significant reduction in indoor NO2 concentrations in the stove replacement and the air purifier group. So again, these were specialized air purifiers that are not um, commercially available. But the NO2 concentrations decreased by about 25 to 50 percent. And this was not a study, again, because we have two different questions we're trying to answer. This did not address the effect on asthma health outcomes. Um, so we expect that it would improve asthma health outcomes, but we don't have a s substantial evidence base here. And the study I think that most people point to, and it is actually in the National Asthma Guidelines, um, in terms of kind of the gold standard for, for what's recommended as a part of asthma management, um, is this study that was published by um, the, it's now called the Inner City Asthma Consortium. It was called the Inner City Asthma Study when it was published. It was published in 2004. This was a big multi-center study, a randomized control trial of school-age inner city children with atopic asthma. And the kids were skin tested. Uh, after identifying what they were allergic to, they received an intervention based on the panel of things they were allergic to. So if someone was not allergic to dust mite, they did not receive a dust mite module. But if they were allergic to mice, they received the mouse module, which included um, assistance with um, integrated pest management. And what I want to point out here is this first question I, I mentioned was, does it reduce exposure? And you can see in the intervention group um, that there were 444 children, and there was about a 44% reduction in cockroach allergen, 59% reduction in dust mite, and so on. And there were differences. The intervention group had greater reduction in those in certain allergens in the control group, and those certain allergens were dust mite and cat primarily, and some suggestion that maybe there was a greater reduction in cockroach allergen. So this kind of intervention seems to work in terms of reducing exposures. So what about the effect on health outcomes? And so this had a, a substantial health outcome. So the blue line is the control group. And one tricky thing about doing asthma studies is if you do not have a control group, you um, everyone gets better in an asthma study. And so you have a hard time telling, if you do a pre-post study design, whether the improvement is because what you, it, it is, is because what you would expect of the natural history of someone just being enrolled in a study, even when they're not receiving an intervention. So the control group here had a reduction in symptoms, and the intervention group had a much greater reduction in symptoms. And the effect size was actually similar to a low dose of asthma controller medication, and that was a point that the authors made in the paper that I think was a very important point that I'll come back to. The effect persisted for at least a year after the intervention was complete. And I think this is another very important point, because we know when you stop medications, uh, the symptoms come right back, and the risk of exacerbations and hospitalizations come right back. And the asthma effect correlated with the reduction in allergen. So the degree of reduction in cockroach and dust mite allergen was correlated with the amount of improvement they had in their asthma. So this is really kind of considered the gold standard evidence, and, and I think really informs um, what I try to do in my clinic what, what all sorts of public health programs do um, and in, informs a lot of, of work that's done um, trying to target housing as a part of asthma management in kids. But I think we still have some challenges. And um, I'm acutely aware of these because when I'm talking to another type of audience, 
these are sort of the skeptical kind of comments that I get back. And these studies that I'm showing up here reflect the skepticism. So one, there was a survey EPA did a few years ago, and they found that only 30% of patients or parents of pediatric patients implemented what was viewed as the very essential environmental control measures. And there was a survey of allergists. So allergists of all physicians really believe in the environment. So this, you would expect that this is a group that would be talking to all of their patients about environmental control. And only three quarters reported emphasizing the importance of environmental control strategies, and only two thirds reported providing educational material about environmental control. And in the conclusion, there was a striking uh, sentence and it, it, that the authors wrote that said the overall efficacy and practicality of environmental control have been questioned because of conflicting clinical trials. Um, and I'm a believer that, that we need to face this head on because we have to start talking in the language of the medical community as one kind of strategy to achieve our goal. So I think our goal should be widespread incorporation of home environmental control across multiple settings. Public health, health system population health settings should be an integral part of individual level patient management and then of course schools and other public indoor spaces. So what would it take to get there? So I have the four, so, so the, the take home here is that I think we need to think like biotech and pharma, which is an unusual way to think for people who are in the public health arena. And I live with someone who's an oncologist and is a researcher, and this is how he thinks. And we have lots of back and forth. And I, I try to persuade him to think more like a public health practitioner. But, so there are four major questions. Do changes in the environment mediate the effects on asthma? This is very hard. This is not something that drug developers have to show. How does the environmental intervention compare to medication in terms of cost and efficacy? to, as Megan and I were talking, to get the healthcare dollar to pay for this, which is a big part of getting this to be widespread, we need to be able to start talking about medication equivalency of, of what we do. And it's a high bar, but I think it's achievable. What are other strategies that can achieve larger and sustained reductions in environmental exposure? So we need more reduction and more sustained reductions, I think, uh, to be able to show a larger health effect that's going to get the attention of the healthcare community. And are public health population approaches to environmental health interventions effective? And what I mean by that is we think a lot on the terms of the individual patient level, and I know both of them have been thinking more on the population level. So I have to wrap up here, but I'm just going to point a couple of things out to highlight. So. This is a controversial question to ask. Do changes in the environment mediate effects on asthma? And I'll show this one slide. This was a trial. Kids were randomized to a low intensity or high intensity intervention. And of all the things you see in the table, only two of the things were reduced to a greater extent in the higher intensity than the lower intensity intervention. But there was a clinical effect in the higher intensity intervention. So was the clinical effect a result of those two out of those 15 things being reduced that are not known to be strongly associated, you know, in and of themselves with asthma? Or are there other things going on or other things that were reduced? And I think if we can understand more what, what mediates the effects of an environmental intervention, I think that's a currency that, that is valuable to the healthcare community. We have a trial in the field right now trying to understand what the medication equivalency is of an individually tailored multifaceted intervention like, that was done in that Morgan trial that I showed you. We have, as Peter mentioned, a study that we're planning, I'm not quite launched yet, trying to look at housing mobility. If someone moves from an inner city neighborhood to a, a better neighborhood, an opportunity neighborhood, what happens to their exposures? Do their, does their asthma get better? And does the improvement in exposure mediate the Im improvement in their asthma? We have a mouse single allergen targeted intervention in Baltimore and Boston. The idea here is if there's a known allergen that's a major problem in the community, that this can be a community level effort to target that particular allergen and you may be able to bring down asthma morbidity in that community. So here's some conclusions and I think that this sort of seesaw reflects how I view the indoor environment which is that there are all these pro-inflammatory things. They're ca causing lung inflammation. 
and we're trying to give asthma medication to counter those. I'm not at all opposed to giving asthma medication. I think it's an important part of asthma management. But if we could start thinking about this problem in terms of demonstrating that when you start to remove some of those exposures, you start to reduce the need for controller medications, I think that makes a lot of sense. So what we know, so I think there's good evidence that there are clear exposures that are associated with asthma morbidity, that there are clear things we can do to reduce those, and that reducing exposures through a multifaceted, individually tailored home intervention is associated with improvements in asthma morbidity. And I would kind of argue that to attain the proposed goal, which is a goal of widespread home environmental intervention, that we need to start thinking like biotech and pharma. So thank you very much. We have uh, time for a couple questions. Do we have any from the audience? Uh, you mentioned uh, cockroaches as a, as a cause. Is that also true of bed bugs and mold? So there's one group I know of who's trying to understand whether bed bugs may be contributing. Um, and what he has found so far is that there's evidence that people are, have an allergic immune response to bed bugs. He is still in the process of trying to decide or, or, or determine or study whether the allergy to the bed bugs is also associated with worse asthma. So I think that's not clear. So mold exposure has been associated with worse asthma. And one of the challenges in the, in the field of mold exposure is that damp housing in general, the strongest evidence is for damp housing be, being associated with asthma. We've had a harder time nailing down whether that's really mold, whether that's dust mites, which like to be in damp areas, or whether there's another reason, whether it's dampness itself. But the strongest evidence base is there's dampness. There's, there is a randomized control trial that was a mold remediation intervention done by Carolyn Kirschmar, and they found a significant improvement in asthma when they remediated those homes among kids that were mold allergic. Um, getting pushback from the owners saying it's not mold, it's damp. Uh, but you're saying the, the effect is probably still the same, whether it's just damp housing or indeed I think mold. We do. I think we know that damp housing is a problem. We know that damp housing causes worse asthma. We don't know whether it directly causes worse asthma or whether it's a marker of a condition in the house that predisposes to some bad exposure. And I think that um, the mold issue is um, there's clearly a health problem associated with mold. There's no question with that about that. Trying to understand um, whether an individual has a health problem because of a certain mold exposure is very tricky. You have to, we have to know what their skin tests or IgE results are. We have to know what their outdoor mold allergens are compared to their indoor mold allergens. We have to have a sense of what kind of state the, the housing is in. And so for any individual patient, there's a lot of clinical judgment that's involved. OK, well, maybe we should move on. And, and hopefully, we'll have some um, time for uh, questions. We did have one question from the field. Okay. Somebody had uh, a little bit of anecdotal evidence. Uh, they grew up in a rural situation. And they were wondering if there had been studies done as there has been in urban populations, but among rural populations, the same type of exposures, ETS. Right, right. So there, there are two issues that are germane, germane to the rural question. And so I have a colleague, um, and they're more, more than just her, um, Tamara Perry, who's at Arkansas, who has looked at exposures in um, patients and families who live in the Delta region. Um, so Mississippi uh, area. Um, and she found that a lot of these exposures are common, but it's really mouse that's more common than cockroach, and that there is a lot of indoor particulate matter exposure through secondhand smoke. Um, so there, there's clearly an issue there, and rural asthma has been, I think, overlooked. The prevalence in her population approached 25% as well. And the population was a low income, predominantly black population. There's a second question about rural exposures, which is, are some of them good for you? And you've probably, many of you have heard about the hygiene hypothesis. And there's now 
10 to 20 years of evidence suggesting that there are certain type of farm exposures that help prevent asthma, which is a different question than if you already have asthma, what makes it worse or what makes it better. Um, but those are not uh, rural homes necessarily. These are children who live in Bavaria and they have a barn attached to the home and from an infant time period they are you know, playing around in the hay and touching the cow, et cetera. So the kinds of exposures they have on a farm are a little bit different than what we might imagine in, in rural communities in the U.S. Okay, All right. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Much, I think uh, maybe we should move on. Just, just uh, adding a little something to that last question, I, uh, some of our, our grantees that have worked in tribal communities have noted, of course, uh, uh, fuel burning uh, stoves produce a lot of particulate and other contaminants, so it's an important uh, asthma trigger source uh, in uh, rural areas as well. Um, so our next speaker today is uh, Helen uh, Margellis Anist. Uh, Helen is the Director of Community Health, Health Initiatives at Sinai Urban Health Institute in Chicago. Helen has been involved with the design, implementation, and evaluation of seven interventions to improve asthma outcomes since 2001. Currently, Helen is the site principal investigator for the Childhood Asthma Gaps in Outcomes, or Chicago Plan, a multi-site asthma collaborative with a $4 million three-year contract with the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI. The Chicago Plan is investigating how health outcomes for black and Latino children with uncontrolled asthma presenting to six Chicago emergency departments might best be optimized. She is also currently the PI for two additional HUD-funded uh, research studies, so those are our uh, technical studies grants. Helen was elected to the board of directors of the Chicago Asthma Consortium in March 2006 and served as the chair from 2009 to 2010. Okay, thank you for um, inviting me today. I'm really honored to be here to present to you some of the work that we've undertaken at the Sign Urban Health Institute Chicago around developing and testing a community health worker-based asthma model that incorporates both medical management and uh, environmental control to improve asthma outcomes. So what I'll do today is I'll first start with some background around uh, who the Sign Urban Health Institute is and the kind of work that we do, and then I'll talk about some of our past initiatives to develop this asthma model. I'm then going to spend substantially more time on a case study, and that would be our most recently completed asthma intervention, Helping Children Breathe and Thrive in Chicago Public Housing. So that'll give you a good sense of the model itself. And the next step will be to talk about what we're currently doing to continue testing that model, continue improving it, um, and translating it to new populations. And then I'll end with some lessons learned and next steps. So the Sinai Urban Health Institute is part of the Sinai Health System in Chicago. Via two campuses, the Sinai Health System serves um, the west and southwest side of the city and two of the most economically challenged communities in the city of Chicago. Our patient population is predominantly non-Hispanic, black, and Latino. And the Sinai Urban Health Institute was actually founded in 2000 as an effort to better understand the community that the Sinai Health System serves so that we could implement effective strategies to reduce health disparities. So our vision is to serve as a leading urban health research institute for eliminating health disparities. And our mission is to develop and implement effective approaches that improve the health of urban communities through data-driven research, interventions, evaluation, and community engagement. So an area that we immediately began working in since 2000 was asthma. And I don't need to talk about the epidemiology of asthma because Dr. Matsui did that very well. Um, but I will just say, with regard to Chicago, we are uh, one of the most segregated cities in the country. And as a result, there are pockets of poverty and of populations that are really experiencing a high asthma burden. So we do have prevalences in certain non-Hispanic, black, and Puerto Rican communities that go are between 20 and 30 percent. And not only is the prevalence high, but we also have evidence that the asthma tends to be poorly controlled. They have higher hospitalization rates, higher emergency department rates, higher mortality, morbidity rates. But I guess the good news here is that we know that asthma is a serious lung disease, but it is something that can be controlled. It just takes effort to do that. And so that's what we've been working on since 2000, is really working to help children and more recently adults understand asthma, control it better, so that they can live full productive lives. 
Just a brief overview of our work um, over the past 16 years, we have implemented a series of nine comprehensive interventions, four of which are currently underway. Our goals throughout have been to decrease asthma-related morbidity and mortality, to improve quality of life for people living with asthma, and to decrease costs and to measure those cost savings. Each of our programs has built on the successes and shortcomings of its predecessors, so we currently, after all this time, have a model that we're very confident in and we're trying to scale up and, work and test in new populations. All of our work at the Seinerbund Health Institute has really focused around the community health worker model. So here I've put up the definition that the American Public Health Association uses for community health workers, which are that they are frontline public health workers who are trusted members of and or have an unusually close understanding of the community served. So what does that mean for SUHI? What that means is that we are hiring community health workers from the communities that we are working within. They don't need to have any prior medical or asthma knowledge or experience as health educators. What they have to have is that connection to that community, that understanding of that community, that ability to speak, quote unquote, the language of the community that allows them to build trusting relationships. If they then have certain core competencies, which we've gotten really good at identifying, we can train them to be community health workers. Here I've put up four of the interventions that preceded the one that I'll be discussing in more detail. Uh, and all I want to say, most of them have been published, you can learn more about them. But what I wanted to say about this was that we had a process by which we started in more of a medical setting, utilizing community health workers working in a clinic. Then we built into a more home environment. Well, actually, we went into the home and began working individually with families living within the home with who had children with poorly controlled asthma. But it wasn't really until 2008 that we really started focusing more comprehensively on environmental improvement in the home and how that might also add to this model that was prior to that time really focusing more on medical management. The key lessons we've learned in our past initiatives that led us to where we are now is that community health workers are immensely effective in establishing relationships of trust with the families that they serve. The issues that impede on a family's ability to manage asthma are complex, and often they go beyond what a community health worker can do by themselves or a medical provider. And that's where the more comprehensive we could be, the more we could wrap around what the family's true needs are and what's keeping them from focusing on asthma, the more effective we could be. So bringing multiple partners to play is important. We also have found consistent evidence of improved asthma control. So across those four different interventions, we saw asthma ED visits and hospitalizations decreasing by between 50 and 80 percent, reductions in symptom frequency, improvements in quality of life. And finally, we've done cost savings analysis of all of our uh, interventions, and we have saved between three and eight dollars saved per dollar spent, depending on the intensity of the approach, the population we were starting with. All right, so now I'm going to go into more depth about helping children breathe and thrive in Chicago public housing, which was our first HUD-funded initiative. Um, this took place between April 2011 and July of 2013. So essentially, by 2011, we had a model that we had tested pretty extensively and were confident that we could translate to new populations. And we saw this call for proposals from HUD asking specifically for asthma interventions to be tested within public housing settings. So we approached the Chicago Housing Authority and asked them if they wanted to partner with us to see if this model that we'd shown to be effective in the community could be translated effectively to public housing. They agreed. We applied for the grant. We were fortunate to receive it and um, had the opportunity to do this. So this was really based on the framework of our established community health worker home visit asthma program. And now we translated that healthy homes as a model to six Chicago public housing developments. We worked very closely with the Chicago Housing Authority in doing this and also with some of their vendors, their building management companies, um, the Family, health, Family Works, which was their social service provider. And we incorporated meaningful participation by the community. Staying true to the community health worker model, we recruited the community health workers from the targeted um, properties that we were working within. Again, they did not need to have any prior asthma knowledge. What they needed to have was that connection to that community and that understanding of that community. We then put them through an intensive training process. Um, we first started with a 75-hour training conducted by our Sinai Asthma Education Training Institute on what asthma is, what, how the home environment impacts on asthma, how to manage asthma triggers in the home, and certain community health worker core skills that that they needed to know. We then have the newly trained community health workers shadow our more experienced community health workers out in the field to get a better sense of how the model works out in the real world. We also have developed a three-tier role play evaluation that we put our community health workers through. So it keeps getting harder and harder with each scenario. And they need to effectively pass each of those before they move on to the next scenario. 
And then the next step is to have them go out into the field and teach with a more seasoned community health worker observing them until they reach a certain level of competency. And then we do continue to um, do quality assurance checks throughout the intervention period. The model that we are utilizing in this intervention and have been since is that we conduct six home visits over a 12-month visit, I'm, I'm sorry, a 12-month period, and the community health worker is leading each of these home visits. They're each about 90 minutes to two hours in length generally, depending on what we find in the home. During those visits, we're both providing um, home-based comprehensive individualized asthma education um, that includes everything from the asthma pathophysiology to how to recognize symptoms of asthma quickly and, and respond accordingly to prevent you know, urgent health resource utilization needs, um, to how to identify triggers in the home environment and eliminate those triggers. We do a comprehensive home environmental assessment at the two-week visit, the six-month visit, and the 12-month visit. So at that point, we're looking for everything that we can find within the home that might be making it more difficult to manage asthma. So um, everything from pests to irritants that the child might be exposed to in cleaning supplies to um, mold and moisture. And another role of the community health workers throughout this process is really to link participants to medical providers and to make sure that they have strong relationships with their providers and also to social services as appropriate. There's a typo on the slide, but essentially we recruited between July of 2011 and September of 2012. Um, we had some initial challenges in participant recruitment. We had a plan going in that we were going to knock on every door in these properties and identify children with asthma. That did not work so well. So fortunately, we had a relationship with, with um, CHA, and we were able to establish a better process um, by which we worked with the case managers that were already in touch with the families to identify children with asthma and have them refer and do a warm transfer to our community health workers. We also ended up identifying a lot of adults with asthma. So our initial intent was to work with children. That's the model that we had tested. That's the model that we wanted to translate. However, we were identifying a lot of adults who did not have children with asthma in their home, uh, who it doesn't look, I mean, we didn't want to keep saying, no, you're not eligible for our program. You're not eligible for our study. So we ended up going back to HUD and we were able to negotiate um, a contract revision, which allowed us to implement an adult pilot. So these sorts of interventions to this point had really been tested mostly with children. So this was a great opportunity to begin collecting some pilot data on whether they could be effective with adults. Our eligibility criteria for this initiative was pretty broad. We just needed people to have asthma and live in one of six public housing properties. So some of our past and future initiatives, we had um, criteria around the uh, severity of the disease, but not for this particular project. We ended up with 262 referrals into the program and were able to consent 158, which means they were enrolled into the program. And that's about 60%, which actually is one of the more efficient referral methodologies we've ever implemented. So that ended up being a success. 73 of those were adults and 85 were children. For the adults, we had a condensed six-month intervention that we were pilot testing. Our loss to study rate was 24%. With regard to data, we had a research assistant who collected the majority of the data. That data was collected at a baseline. The research assistant attended the baseline visit with the community health worker to collect consent and then also to collect the baseline data. They would then call the participant monthly over the phone to collect additional data, and then they also attended the 12-month visit to collect data. The community health worker does collect some data, and that is the data that's helpful as they implement their intervention. So that would be the home environmental assessment, that would be the medication technique, and that would be some asthma knowledge sorts of questions. So our participants, here you see the children in the middle column and the adults on the far right. Essentially, our participants were predominantly non-Hispanic black. Um, the children, 94% of them were Medicaid insured. This was before the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, so our adults, we did have 27% who were uninsured. Income, relatively low income, low ed lower education level, so on and so forth. While we were not requiring that the people that we were enrolled into the study have poorly controlled asthma, you'll see here that 80%, um, if you combine the purple and the lighter blue, 80% had asthma that would be defined as poorly controlled per the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute guidelines. Moving into our outcomes data, now I'm going to focus specifically on the child data. Here you're seeing, we had two overarching goals, one of which was to reduce asthma-related morbidity. So we measured that by looking at symptom frequency and then looking at urgent health resource utilization. This particular slide is showing the data around symptom frequency. So as one example, if you look on the far 
left, you can see that that's focusing on daytime symptoms in the past two weeks. And at baseline, the average child had had four days of visits over, I'm sorry, four days of asthma symptoms over the past two weeks. Over the course of the follow-up period, they had less than one. So that was about an 80% reduction, and it was statistically significant. And we had similar reductions in nighttime symptoms and days needing rescue medications. Looking at urgent health resource utilization, now this is combining ED visits, hospitalizations, and urgent clinic visits. So in the year prior to the intervention, 42% of children had had at least two of those, so at least two ED visits, hospitalizations, or urgent clinic visits. In the intervention year, that was reduced to just 15% of children having had two or more urgent health resource utilization events. Um, in fact, by the intervention year, 75% or three out of every four of our children had not had any urgent health resource utilization needs. Our other overarching goal was to improve quality of life of the child and of the family, and we specifically measured caregiver quality of life because it's been found to correlate well with the child's quality of life. We use a tool that's used extensively in asthma research, the Juniper Pediatric Asthma Caregiver Quality of Life Questionnaire. A great thing about this questionnaire is that it's been studied to the extent that we know that if you can reduce, improve quality of life score by 0.5, that's associated with clinically significant improvement in asthma. So if you look at the overall score here, we were able to improve it by 0.7 between the baseline and the 12-month visit, which was both statistically and clinically significant improvement in quality of life, but it also reinforces our other findings. And finally, just a slide that, that shows some of the sorts of environmental home triggers that we came across and were able to address. We actually, our community health workers will address any issues that are within their control to address. So if it's something like cleaning up some mold in a bathtub using um, asthma-friendly techniques, they, they will teach the family to do that, they will do that. But if it becomes more complex, like a roach infestation in a building, then we need to bring in somebody to, to assist with that. So here you're seeing those more complex issues, and we received 72 referrals that we had to then refer out to building management companies, and we were able to successfully get 62 of those resolved, which is 86%. Um, I think one of the greatest successes of this project was that we were able to work with these building management companies to develop better processes by which to refer and get things addressed that were affecting not just kids with asthma, but the people living within public housing. And this is not the greatest slide, but it does show um, that this particular project was published, and so if you're interested in learning more, the citation is here. All right, so now I want to just transition and talk a little bit about what we've done with that model since that time. So um, beginning in 2013, we began looking at, with additional funding from HUD, we implemented Helping Chicago's West Side Adults Breathe and Thrive. So now we had some pilot data from the project I just discussed that allowed us to show that it did seem that this approach could be effective with adults, and this was an opportunity to really look at it more formally. So this is innovative as it's one of the first studies to assess the effectiveness and feasibility of this model with adults. We're working with adults with poorly controlled asthma living in one of nine West and Southwest Side Chicago communities. Public housing is part of this population, but we are expanding it to include the broader community in these areas. And we have multiple engaged partners that are helping us to be very comprehensive in our approach. In red here, you can see outlined the area that we're working within. We are receiving referrals from CHA developments, um, Sinai's ED and hospital, primary and specialty care doctors, and via community organizations and events. And actually, our initial phase of recruitment is done, and we did enroll 202 adults into this study and are now following them up for outcomes. The structure of the intervention approach is similar to what it was for the child intervention that I discussed, so six visits over 12 months. We do provide assistance in rolling in insurance um, and establishing a medical home and substantial case management, housing issue referrals, and smoking cessation and reduction support. I don't have time to go into the outcomes that we're beginning to look at, so our preliminary outcomes do, however, suggest that we are seeing effects that are similar to what we've seen in our pediatric studies. So moving on from there, I'm really excited about this particular grant that we've much more recently begun working on. Um, beginning in October of 2015, we received another grant from HUD to expand that adult study to incorporate a 12-month randomized study of maintained effect. So this is an out outstanding question. So we, we, we and others have shown that these models are, seem to be effective with children, more recently possibly with adults. Um, but what happens when they go away? And is there something we could do that might be lower intensity that would help us to maintain those outcomes for a longer time and truly make a longer term impact on, on health? Um, so that's what we're trying to answer here with, with this study. And we're really excited to have started this um, and that HUD was forward thinking and funding the study. 
We also have worked extensively since 2011 to begin scaling this model up and integrating it with more within standard healthcare delivery. And so beginning in 2011, we launched our Asthma Care Partners Program. Initially, um, this was a partnership between SUHI and Family Health Network, which is a Medicaid managed care organization in Chicago. And that model continues to be in place. We've to date worked with 583 adults and children that in this particular um, model and have shown that we can work within med Medicaid managed care to implement these sorts of models and we're seeing similar effectiveness in, in, those, in that population. However, more recently we've begun exploring additional possibilities um, with several additional Medicaid and managed care organizations that are expressing an interest. And finally, I don't have time to talk about this and it was um, mentioned in my bio, but essentially we are part of a um, PCORI funded study compare coordinated healthcare interventions for child asthma gaps and outcomes trial, which is a comparative effectiveness research study that's looking at this model now, the community health worker model being one of several compared that's working out of emergency departments. It's pretty exciting. All right, so just summarizing all of the evidence that we've had, um, in our 15-year history, we've worked with over 1,700 children and adults. We've had consistent evidence of improved asthma control. We've also had consistent improvement in intermediate outcomes, such as the presence of home triggers, self-efficacy, and medication technique. We've looked at cost savings throughout, and we've averaged about $5 saved per dollar spent. And we have countless personal letters and stories, some of which you see here, and lots of qualitative evidence to support that this model is well-received and effective. Just some lessons learned and challenges um, around community health workers. They are highly effective in implementing these sorts of models and improving asthma I believe improving asthma outcomes with the people that they work with. However, effective hiring training processes are really important, as is appropriate supervision. And we've done a lot of work in this area more recently, um, looking at best practices for implementing and, and uh, evaluating community health worker programs. Participants and participants we're working with have a lot of true competing priorities. So asthma is not always at the center of their lives, even though it's what we're coming in to talk about. Again, I think that's where community health workers can be really important in understanding where a person really is in their life and, and dealing um, with the issues that they're faced with. Collaboration is key. There's been a need for legal housing and social service referrals throughout. So it's important to have the right partners in place. And one of those partners should absolutely be the community. So in conclusion, um, we've made a lot of progress. And what we're really working on right now is uh, translating this model to new populations, testing it with adults, for example, and novel dissemination models, such as through the emergency department. And another novel model that I'd like to, to eventually start working on, and I know um, the next presenter will talk about, is starting with housing as the foundation of the work instead of the disease, and working to more comprehensively build in health more, com more comprehensively. So with that, here's just one of my community health workers likes to say, teamwork makes the dream work. So here's a few pictures of them and all the acknowledgments. So thank you. Do we have a question for, for Helen? Uh, yeah, if you could use the, uh, the mic so the since this is webcast, so uh, folks who tuned in can, can hear it would be great. Do you have any uh, <clears throat> estimates, rules of thumb, for how much it costs to train the community health worker and the cost of employing them per year? This could be just a rough, just yeah, that's curious about scale. Price. Well, in terms of employing them, I mean, it's going to vary depending on, you know, where you live and what the cost of living is. Um, but, you know, with benefits, you're looking at probably like $50,000 a year. Um, possibly. Uh, and again, experience level, of course, of the community health worker plays into that. Uh, in terms of training, it depends on how specifically you go about it. I mean, we have a very comprehensive approach. So we have um, begun to be contracted out quite a bit to, to train other community health workers in other institutions. And so I could speak a little to that. I mean, that's one way of doing it. If you're going to do it in-house, I mean, it does take, I'd say, about three months to really effectively train a community health worker. With, with the community health worker model, um, is it realistic to train them to address uh, multiple health outcomes? Has, has there been research on that? That's another area, actually, I didn't get a chance to go through all my next steps, but that's another area that I think we're beginning to think more about. So whether it's that you're training 
it's definitely possible you could train one company health worker to work across multiple health conditions. However, I think what probably makes more sense is more of a team-based approach where you have a variety of company health workers, all with varying areas of expertise. Some might be trained in diabetes and obesity, and another would be trained in asthma and COPD or whatever it might be. And that team that you could sort of comprehensively use to, to improve overall health. Thank yeah. you very much. Can, I, can, can you yeah. suggest how the uh, community health worker has a reporting relationship with the rest of the health community? Yes. So, um, you know, whenever I get told by somebody that they try to use community health workers in a health care setting and it didn't work, it almost always comes back to who's supervising the community health worker. That That's the issue. So I think that's a very great question. We, whenever we can, we try to use former community health workers, right? So to have a career path so the community health worker can become a community health worker supervisor who's directly supervising community health workers. Um, and then that community health worker supervisor would be reporting to a program manager or a nurse or whoever is appropriate in that particular system. Um, but I think the most important thing, and this is an area that we're now trying to study more and learn more about as well, is to tr we also can train supervisors of community health workers, right? So to better understand who a community health worker is, what they're bringing to the table, what, where they might not have skills like computer skills or the innate ability to manage a caseload. You might have to teach them that. They have other skills that you can't train somebody on. So um, I think we're doing a lot of work to try to help everybody understand um, who community health workers are and what the value that they bring and therefore uh, supervise them appropriately. Did that answer your question? Thanks very much, Ellen. I just wanted to mention um, that we'll maybe extend this uh, 10 minutes or so if we uh, have uh, enough uh, Q&A. Um, so uh, for those who are on the webcast, uh, just to let you know and those in the room. Um, pleasure, it's a pleasure to introduce our last speaker, Dr. Uh, Megan Sandel. Um, Megan's been involved in the Healthy Homes Movement uh, since the start, so we've, we've known her uh, for a long time and have been working together um, because of that. Uh, um, Dr. Sandel is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the Boston University Schools of Medicine and Public Health. Uh, she's the Medical Director of National Center for Medical Legal Partnership and is the Principal Investigator with, uh, is a Principal Investigator with Children's Health Watch. She is the former Pediatric Medical Director of Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program and is a nationally recognized expert on housing and child health. In uh, 1998, she published with other physicians at Boston Medical Center, the Docs for Kids Report, a national report on how housing affected child health. And over the course of her career, Dr. Sandel has written numerous peer-reviewed scientific articles and papers on this subject. She has served as the PI for numerous NIH, HUD, and foundation grants working with the Boston Public Health Commission and the Massachusetts Department of Public Health to improve the health of vulnerable children, particularly those with asthma. She has served on many national boards as well, including Enterprise Community Partners and the American Pat Academy of Pediatrics. Um, So uh, thank you so much, Peter. I really, uh, it's such a pleasure to be here today because in many ways, I'm not sure where my career path would be without HUD and the support that I've received over the years. So I just am really pleased to be here and to thank um, many of you for your support. Um, so I'm going to, um, I, as kind of the cleanup hitter of the lineup here, I'm going to get to try and talk a little bit about kind of ideas around place-based um, uh, initiatives to improve asthma and health, particularly uh, focusing on public housing. And then I'm going to hopefully then talk from kind of a population health and a policy perspective, particularly reflecting a bit on what we've been able to do in Boston with HUD support and other federal support around thinking about a lot of different ways in which we can make really housing to be a platform for health. Um, as Peter mentioned, one of the studies that I've worked on has been with the Mass Department of Public Health called the READY study, which is reducing ethnic and racial asthma disparities in youth. Um, the Mass Department of Public Health undertook this study really because it viewed community health worker studies, many like what Helen has talked about, as one way to reduce the really awful asthma disparities that we see, you know, kids who are zero to four in African-American 
African-American in Massachusetts have four times the rate of ER visits than similar white children. And so we talked about focusing on young children and using the community health worker intervention first really pioneered in Seattle with Jim Krieger with some HUD funding that really um, became a really important uh, model for us to translate to Massachusetts. Um, we really have focused a lot, particularly with the Mass Department of Public Health on sustainability. How do we make that the standard of care so that whatever hospital or health center you walk into, you have that available. Um, two of the hospitals were involved in the intervention of this, Boston Medical Center where I work, and then Bay State Medical Center, which is in the western part of the state in Springfield. We conducted the intervention and then assisted um, in kind of developing it as a case study. One of the interesting notes is we actually hired the community health workers out of our medical home. So instead of it being something that's more public health department based, we were really trying to test that. Um, just to give you a flavor of the interventions, we did not do this as a randomized control trial design because we felt like that had already been done by Seattle. It was really about could we translate and get the same efficacy that we would expect to see. And good news, we did. We saw huge reductions in ED visits from over 60% down to 27%, reductions in hospitalizations, 27% down to 4%, um, reductions in urgent care use, in oral steroid medication, and then really focused a lot on kind of the quality measures of how did people understand their asthma. So not only higher rates of having an asthma action plan that they said that they remembered that they had, but that they actually used it and that it was something that became kind of the roadmap for them moving forward. Um, but I'm going to actually focus more on what we have done with, um, in partnership around a place-based community health worker approach. And I just want to really call out, particularly Boston Housing Authority, as being really a decades now partner in this. Um, I think they really have served as a model for how a large public housing authority can really take that on as a mission. Um, for those that aren't familiar, Boston Housing Authority is the largest public housing authority in New England. It's the largest property owner in Boston, and it actually houses close to 10% of all of Boston's residents, um, about 50,000 people. Um, and and for those that would say, well, why would you partner with Boston Housing Authority for this? This is a map of the city of Boston. And what you see in the dark green center area of the inner city is the highest rates of asthma. Um, so in the darkest area in the center in Roxbury, which is one of the neighborhoods of Boston, 22 per thousand kids are hospitalized with asthma relative to the state average of only four per thousand kids. And so when you start thinking about where are you going to concentrate your efforts in kind of the public health world, we call it hot spotting, right? This idea, right, where are you going to focus? You want to look at your map. And then when you look at that map, you want to dot all of where the public housing authority um, developments are. And guess what? There's a lot of concentration in these highest areas. And so when we thought about it, we had replicated the community health worker model, very similar to what Helen talked about, where you find the asthmatic first, and then you go to your home. We wanted to flip that around and say, what if we found the homes first, and then tried to find the asthmatics? And so why would you want to focus on public housing residents? The other piece that I think is really important to think about is that these residents are on average much sicker than the average population. And so in um, Massachusetts, and particularly in Boston, when we do regular surveillance, which is something called the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey, some people call it BRFSS because it's B-R-F-S-S, -S. We added a question pretty, you know, in the last 10 years, which was, do you live in public housing? Yes, no. Do you live in other subsidized housing? Yes, no. And what that now allows is from the public health department is that we can look at the population that lives in public housing relative to other that are receiving other forms of rental assistance relative to the general population that's not in public housing. And so, for instance, when we look at something that's pretty predictive of poor um, health outcomes and health utilization, which is just a simple question, how do you rate your health? And you can say it's excellent, it's very good, it's good, it's fair, or poor. What we see is that 33% of Boston Housing Authority patients say they're in fair or poor health. 
And that is being shown to be predictive of bad health utilization, increased mortality. It's just a very validated question. Um, similarly, we looked at poor mental health and uh, over 20% of uh, the Boston Housing Authority population is saying they're in poor mental health relative to only 7% of the general population. And then we have talked about smoking. Smoking is something that's higher in rental assistant and Boston Housing Authority. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how Boston has kind of attacked that. Um, and so what we did is we said, okay, we know that some of the sickest people live in Boston Authority housing. We know that there are some neighborhoods that have higher rates of asthma and have more housing developments. And so out of that came what we called Project LEAP, which was really doing public housing based community health workers and using that as a place-based approach to improve health and asthma. And so we called Project LEAP, it was Living Environmental Assessments Project. And so what's interesting here is that we actually did environmental assessments and interventions on everyone, even if they didn't have asthma. Because the theory was, was that the asthmatic patient was living next to somebody who may not be taking care of their environment, and therefore the pests were going in back and forth between the walls, the mold was being an issue, the smoke was traveling, and so we were taking a, a, a building-wide approach to it. And so we really focused not on putting asthma in the name of the title, but really focusing on living environments and being able to make that work. Um, and so this was in partnership with the hospital I work at, Boston Medical Center, and the Boston Public Health Commission, and uh, we were enrolling 160 families. And as you can imagine, we focused on two housing developments that were among the oldest in the Boston Housing Authority portfolio that were in the, the, um, uh, the neighborhood of Roxbury that I mentioned. One of them is Lennox Camden. The Lennox side dates back to 1939. The Camden side dates back to 1949. Um, high rates of uh, Hispanic and, and black populations, about 375 units, about 650 people in total. The average income in the development is about $13,000. Um, and about 40% of the people that are living there are kids, 0 to 18. Um, the Alice Taylor development is a little bit um, uh, younger at 1951 when it was built. Um, but again, very similar rates of Hispanic and blacks, 366 units, about 850 people, a little bit denser, um, a little bit higher in the income range, about 15,000. And again, about 36% were young kids. And so we took these two housing developments and we hired the community health workers from people who lived in BHA housing. Um, we actually made a conscious a decision not to hire people who lived in those developments, um, but people who lived in other developments. And we did that both in terms of wanting to offer a career path for people who lived in BHA housing, and I'll talk a little bit about, about how we learned from that, but also that we knew that people who lived in, in um, public housing would be able to talk to other public housing um, uh, residents, hopefully in a way that was culturally appropriate. And that is something that is very much part of being a community health worker. Um, and so our really our study objective, the goals were to say, what's the effect of a community health worker in a place-based model, where you're trying to start from the place first and then find the people second? Um, we wanted to see whether we could reduce exposure to triggers, particularly in very old public housing developments. Um, and then we wanted to see whether or not what the effects of the home-based uh, asthma environmental education was on asthma control. I want to say the important thing of note was we did not do asthma education with people. Um, we did mostly environmental reduction. Um, if people had uncontrolled asthma and needed connection back to their medical home, we did do that. But, but I'll be talking about just the effect of environmental only um, uh, education on asthma control today. Um, so we enrolled 160 people. The uh, interventions were things like, as I said, education around environmental triggers. We actually did facilitation around ordering work orders, so very similar to what Helen talked about, about the nice thing was you were partnering with the landlord, right? You knew how to do the um, uh, the work orders in order to actually get the, the conditions fixed. Um, we did a lot of advocacy for other social services, food, um, uh, other types of, you know, people who are having trouble affording medicines or other things, um, ref uh, referral to free local resources, continued support, particularly around phone support in between of visits, and then follow up over time. Um, I should note that we did three visits over the time period, um, generally between uh, three to six months. 
And so uh, we enrolled 160 people. About 80% were female-headed households, about 20% male-headed households. Um, the race ethnicity reflected those of the developments, about 47% Hispanic, 38% black, non-Hispanic, 1% um, white, and 12% other. The education did vary. About 26% did not have um, a graduated high school education, about 55% a high school or G uh, graduate equivalent, um, about 12% had some college. Um, the average age was about 39, though it ranged from uh, 22 up to 74. Um, we, uh, it's interesting, we thought we would find more asthmatics than we thought, mostly based on previous research that showed up to 50% of um, Boston Housing Authority residents could have asthma. What we found was actually about 27% of the 160 units had at least one asthmatic, and many of the household had more than one. And so if you had more than one asthmatic in, uh, um, in a, a unit, we actually would enroll them too. So 64 total asthmatics, um, uh, 20, reflecting 27% of the units. Um, but they were fairly poorly controlled. So without using poorly controlled as an entry criteria, which oftentimes a lot of community health worker studies are focused on high risk asthmatics, we still found that almost 60% of them were uh, you know, not well or poorly controlled. Um, only about 40% had a well-controlled asthma control test score. Um, 12 percent are reported in asthma related hospitalization and 36 some type of an emergency or urgent care visit. So again, without trying, we found pretty sick asthmatics pretty quickly. Um, uh, one of the things that I added to this study was actually looking at stress. And the thought here is that there's more and more evidence that actually housing quality can be related to mental health outcomes. Um, there's some really nice research that was supported by the MacArthur Foundation, Rebecca Vine Coley out of Boston College, that showed that housing quality was the strongest predictor of kids' achievement in school and parental mental health and distress um, outside of the other typical things that you would expect. And so um, we actually showed that over three visits, we were actually able to decrease a perceived stress score from 17 um, down to 15.8 over that time period. So again, being able to talk about how environmental control can actually have different health outcomes beyond just what the asthma outcomes were. Um, and then uh, we did see reduction in triggers. These being very old developments, mold is actually a, a very uh, high rate. We Over 90% of the homes had some type of a mold or dampness trigger. We were able to get that down to 75%. We reduced pest infestations by 24%. 24% down to 16%. And chemical use, which is very common, um, was about 62%. We got that down to about 52%. There were lower level exposures of dust, pets, and smoke where we were not able to make any types of um, movement on those. I think that uh, it reflects, I think, a little bit of the focus on the, the other triggers instead of the other, of those triggers per se. Um, and then we were able to actually improve asthma control over the course of the study so that we went from 40% to close to 60% of people that were now well controlled in their asthma just by focusing on environment, not necessarily focusing on asthma education. Um, and so this is one of our participants, uh, Raina Sanchez. Project LEAP is a very good program. They helped me out and still are. I'm satisfied. Um, and so one of the things that we uncovered was the work order system. So for instance, one of the things that came out was that no one in the work order system spoke Spanish. So you could imagine that it's pretty hard to call in work orders if you are trying to you know, yell over the phone in English to um, uh, back to somebody. And so one of the things that happened was actually one of our community health workers was hired away from us to work in the work order system um, because she spoke Spanish and English. And so we considered that one of our success stories. Um, I think that place-based recruitment is, I think, the right way to go, though there are some um, pros and cons. One of the things we noted between the two developments was very different um, resident advisory boards. So the tenant task forces in each of them were quite different. And so that one of the the developments that didn't have as good of a resident um, task force, it was much harder to get referrals word of mouth because there wasn't as much social cohesion in that particular development. Whereas only literally, you know, two blocks away was another development that did have a much more active resident task force. And in that, we had um, instituted a refer-a-friend program, our 
our institutional review board signed off on we could reimburse someone if they referred someone who actually enrolled in the program. And so that that worked a lot better, actually, in the second development. And part of that was because the resident task force knew most people in the developments, knew where somebody had a kid with asthma or an adult with asthma, and then was able to say, you need to find that person. I'm going to call them for you. I'm going to get them their number. And so that it's an interesting kind of idea around the social networking that can sometimes make or break a place-based uh, approach. Um, the other thing is that we have now had, we trained five community health workers in total over the three years of the study, and each of them are now working in some related community health worker style field, whether they be helping with facilitation of the um, work order system. One of them is actually working on another place-based approach to decrease use of sugar-sweetened beverages in the same high-density neighborhoods that have these really high rates of obesity and other problems. Um, so I just want to step back and kind of reflect a little bit on a timeline of what has happened in Boston around Healthy Homes collaborations. And a lot of this is with support of, of HUD. And so that um, in 1999, uh, we actually founded an asthma office and a Healthy Homes office at the Boston Public Health Commission with one of the first Healthy Homes demonstration grants. Um, in 2005, we actually started a program that I'll describe in more detail called Breathe Easy at Home, which is actually a direct referral to um, uh, code enforcement, the inspectional services department in the city of Boston, where when I see a patient in my office now, I can log onto the web and refer directly to code enforcement to try and get that um, uh, home improved. Um, we'll talk a little bit about healthy pest-free public housing, which is an initiative started at Boston Housing Authority showing that you can do actual great um, uh, pest control and actually achieve a pest-free status. Um, we'll talk about BHA as the first large public housing authority to go smoke free um, and then talk about some of the newer things the rental inspection ordinance and then uh, the office of fair housing which actually now is the office of fair housing and equity um, so Breathe Easy at Home is, is now a, a really a nationally uh, award-winning program acknowledged by EPA and the National Association of um, City and County Officials. Um, it's where the Inspectional Services Department, health institutions like Boston Medical Center and the Boston Public Health Department work together to try and make healthy homes really something that can be done more achieved. And so if you live anywhere in the city of Boston and you're seen at any of the health centers, you should be able to access a web-based referral directly to code enforcement. Um, and what happens is the inspectional services department then will put email updates back to the referral source so you know what happened. Um, and so what we've seen is now the referrals have kind of taken off over the years for that first year in 2005 where we piloted just 16 to uh, most recently uh, close to 250 referrals a year. We actually have started to look at this again and thinking about what we call Breathe Easy 2.0. We think this number should be closer to 1,000 kids actually in Boston. And so we're doing now quality improvement to think about ways in which we can do a better job. And what's interesting is we've thought a lot about where the failures in our system are. And actually, the biggest failure is we as physicians don't ask, right? And if we don't ask, then you don't make the referral. And so we're thinking about ways in which we may actually skip the asking part and just say, you live in a neighborhood that has a lot of um, old housing and other things. We should just automatically refer you to this program. Um, healthy pest-free public housing was something that was supported uh, initially by HUD and then by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. It was a partnership between Boston Public Health Commission, Boston Housing Authority, a tenant rights organization, Committee for Boston Public Housing, and the BU School of Public Health. It was a multi-pronged intervention um, looking at standardized integrated pest management contracts using developments in resident education and actually doing pesticide buyback. And they've actually been able to document a reduction in work orders by pests. Um, one of the technical studies is actually now looking at what was the different doses of the um, pest management that was done in the different developments and looking at the long-term health um, and mental health, not only physical health, but mental health of the residents. Um, Smoke-free public housing is something where, um, uh, through a lot of uh, collaboration, Boston Housing Authority began the process of going smoke-free in rental housing in 2010 and fully implemented it in 2012. Again, this was a cross-sector collaboration between Boston Housing Authority, Boston Public Health Commission, Committee for Boston Public Housing, because we wanted to do resident outreach and education to say, this is why we're doing this. This is why this is important. Is this something that you want? And I think that what's also cool is the Boston Public Health Commission at that point started a smoke-free housing 
housing registry. So aside from Boston public housing, if you wanted to rent an apartment, you didn't know which ones were smoke free. And so it was offered as a free service to landlords to be able to, to uh, list their apartments as smoke free and provide technical assistance and training to other um, landlords who wanted to go smoke free. Peter alluded to this, and this is a trend that we have now seen over the last couple of years, is, as I said before, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey tracks people who live in public housing, people who live in other rental-assisted housing, and those that live in regular housing in Boston. And what was noted is in 2006, um, the reported asthma rate in adults was about 23%. Um, in 2008, they saw it drop to 16%, and in 2010, it dropped down to 13%. Um, what's of note is that over the same time period, other assisted housing did not see that decrease. You saw a consistent rate of somewhere between 22 and 23 percent that had um, uh, that had asthma, and you saw no change in the all others. And so, part of this is actually attributed to much of the work that we we're talking about: pest-free housing, smoke-free housing, other ways in which you had started to see that. Um, uh, just of note, the Inspectional Services Department has really embraced its public health mission, and so they actually got passed by the City Council in 2012 a proactive rental inspection ordinance. What the commissioner said to me is, let's not wait until somebody comes to your office and has a problem with asthma. Let's make sure every single home is asthma safe to start with. And so that now covers 150,000 units in the city of Boston need to be certified every five years that they're passing code enforcement. And as I mentioned, the Office of Fair Housing has added the word equity because it views that a lot of what it's doing is this principle of advancing equity, very consistent with what the um, uh, affirmative rule on fair housing that HUD is now really pushing forward. Um, and now it has taken over the smoke-free housing registry and is doing a lot of resident and landlord outreach. And so now what I showed is kind of a timeline is really a consortium of you have health institutions like mine, Boston Medical Center. You've got the Boston Public Health Commission, the city's um, public health department. You've got inspectional services department. You have the Boston Office of Fair Housing and Equity. And then you have Boston Housing Authority as a consortium that are really trying to think about these issues as a way to improve population of health in Boston. And I think this hopefully can really serve as a model across the country of what you can do with the investments. Um, and so with that, I just want to thank you again and open for questions. Thank you, Do you have any questions for Megan? I've got one. Uh, Megan. Um, oops. Your place-based approach, uh, so you went into units of uh, households with, with no asthmatic child or adult. Uh, what's their incentive to change? Yeah. Uh, how, and what was the difference between the, yeah. the two? Yeah, I think it's interesting. So as I uh, alluded to, I've done both models, right? I've done the find the asthmatic first and go to their home. And in this case, we were going to the, the unit first and then trying to find the asthmatics. What's interesting is that typically in an asthmatic kid unit where we're doing this environmental education, we actually see larger reductions in the asthma um, control. So typically we see about at least one trigger of the six that I mentioned that gets reduced. In this study, we saw a, a lower reduction, about half of, of actually things that were changed. I think particularly of note, chemicals is a very common trigger that's actually fairly modifiable once you can engage someone in the fact that there are easier ways to clean that isn't like bleach and fabulosa and things like that. Um, in this case, it was a, a more difficult sell, I think, in this because you didn't have the asthma as kind of the driving factor. The other piece is that typically when we do the community health worker interventions with kids with asthma, we're identifying kids that have had an ER or hospitalization typically recently it tends to be a teachable moment in a family's life where they don't want that to happen again. And so that I do think it means um, there may be a higher dose. I really like what Elizabeth talked about recently around this idea we need to think like pharma. Pharma thinks about dosing all the time. What's the high dose effect? What's the low dose effect? Do some people need a longer dose? And I think we need to somewhat think more about tailoring and being able to think about it. The other piece that I've been more intrigued with recently is the idea of community-wide education. So we always focus on individual level interventions. And I, I think that integrated pest management is a nice way of thinking about those were community-wide interventions around you can be pest-free, we need to get rid of the pesticides. We need to do a better job. You need to report when you have pests because that is going to be feedback that the contractor's not doing their job. And as that kind of community-wide education was done, I think it was proved to be a lot more effective. 
Thank you. Um, and then, then one more. Any anybody else come up with a question in the meantime? Um, one one statistic I saw I noticed uh, I think it was one of your slides mm -hmm. uh, reduction f of mold yeah. from ninety four percent to but it's still seventy five percent. What's what's going on there? Uh, maybe our friends from Office of Public Housing might have something to say about that too. I know funds for maintenance capital expenditures have, have been cut. We've heard that. We hear that a lot from housing authorities, but did, did yeah, you yeah. get any insight into what's happening? Yeah, it was, it's really interesting. So um, as I noted, that particular, the first housing development we started with was Lennox Camden. So 1939, 1949. Um, uh, one of the things they have, and I think that Boston Housing Authority also has really tried hard to do this, is trying to marry energy dollars with renovation dollars to try and do that. So Lennox Camden has recently um, undergone particularly replacement of its roof as part of an actual greening as a way to try and um, uh, improve the um, uh, the energy efficiency of the of the place, but that also can be something that can uh, address it. I will say, uh, I feel like I learn something new every time I do studies, um, and so and you know, as in most things, I learn most things because just by listening, right? And so the two funny stories I can say about Lennox Camden is at the end of the study, we were doing a, a reflection back, and one of the things that became clear is they had done the greening where they actually changed it so that you had um, a pre-programmed thermostat. So so you went from old steam radiator heat, right, to now a pre-programmed thermostat that was, you know, going to be, you know, you know, 68 in the middle of the night and it was going to be like 72 during the day. And they literally, the more than one participant talked about the heat being out and needing to do the heat being out work orders when it became clear that the heat wasn't out. They were just used to it being 85 to 90 degrees with the steam radiator. So, so there was this huge education that needed to be done around this is what like normal temperature should be like, right? As we were kind of progressing. Um, uh, the other one that was really interesting was that when we talked about prioritization of work to be done and talked about the fact the roofs were going to be replaced and things like that, what residents actually wanted was buzzers at the bottom of the stairwell for safety. That was more important to them than actually the roofs being replaced and the mold because they because safety was the bigger deal. And so I do think that to an extent, um, uh, I now more and more talk about environment as being both physical and social environment and that we need to more and more accommodate and think about different ways to, to do it um, in terms of moving forward. But I do think this highlights the challenges of doing home environmental remediation in extremely old units with a lot of deferred maintenance. I mean, BHA alone estimates $2 billion of deferred maintenance that we're never going to catch up on. And so ways in which we need to start thinking about it again with a more more holistic solution instead of piecemeal solution. Thank you, Megan. Uh, another question, please. Yeah, we had a question from the uh, field. Did the Housing Authority staff also receive training on environmental in interventions so that when they're in doing maintenance, they can follow up with stuff also? Yeah, so one of the nice things was the um, the community health workers uh, that were part of the program were not only BHA residents, but they actually became BHA employees. And so they were able to communicate directly with maintenance staff um, and the manager so that they were all on the same system. They were all able to, to check on things and, and things like that. Um, yes, the, um, the nice thing about uh, Boston is that we try and do collaboration meetings often. And so um, uh, the Breathe Easy at Home Consortium, for instance, has had now, we liken it to a wedding, where every year you have a meeting where at the table is the inspector that's assigned to that district, the maintenance staff that are um, assigned to the developments in that district, and they all sit together when we do education around healthy homes, asthma, other types of things. And so um, uh, certainly the ISD inspectors and many of the maintenance staff have gone through some of the National Center for Healthy Health 
Housing Training Institute, Essentials for Healthy Housing, and other things. There are always going to be improvements, there's no doubt. Um, but I do think that um, the right kind of tools of how to do good um, maintenance are there. That being said, our community health workers did sometimes have to dog cases where they were like, the work order doesn't wasn't done right, we're going to put it in again. And that's where, again, this continuity and follow-up becomes really important. Megan, my question hopefully will be short. I wanted to know if a public housing authority or another assisted housing owner or manager is interested, they may know that they have residents that have asthma and they're interested perhaps in, in following the community health worker model, where would they begin? Yeah. So I do think that a lot of um, public housing departments have really embraced this. Um, certainly Boston Public Health Commission, Massachusetts Department of Public Health. The Massachusetts Department of Public Health actually is creating a board of registration for community health workers, the same way I as a physician need to register with the board around um, being a doctor and going through that certification. They're doing the same thing for community health workers, hopefully to get it reimbursable under the Affordable Care Act. But I would say that typically there is now, it's like a recognized job description under the Department of Labor, so they can actually look at what the, the job description looks like. Um, I do want to kind of really emphasize what Helen said. They're not all created equal, so you need to really tr go through training. And I really, um, there are certified trainings in almost all the states, I think, around um, you know becoming a community health worker. And then there are specific ones related to asthma, the National Center for um, uh, healthy Housing has a com asthma community health worker training um, just to be able to understand these types of things. And so I do think that um, it's interesting. In some ways, the term community health worker encompasses a lot of other terms, outreach worker, health educator, um, uh, outreach, you know, uh, you know, health outreach worker or whatever. But I do think that that particular um, designation puts you in line with a lot of other health um, uh, workforce that may be really important for a housing development to take on. Um, the, for the panel, uh, to tie two of our programs together, do you know of any um, tracking of a uh, public housing authority that's gone smoke-free and asthma prevalence? Besides Boston? Yeah. It's a good question. So the way that Boston was able to do it was because it, it actually created that question in the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey. I am not aware how many other places have done it, right? Where they've they've built in a a health tracking system um, that specifically is able to subset out populations so that it can track it itself. Um, I will say, and this I think speaks to actually both what Elizabeth and Helen were talking about, is um, I actually think payment reform and the Affordable Care Act are opportunities for us to talk about what essentially is the equivalency of care that can be from environmental remediation versus medication. And so one of the things that we did at Boston Medical Center was we asked BHA for all their addresses, right? And we said, give us the, you know, the Excel spreadsheet of all your addresses. We ran them through our electronic health record. And we've got 10,000 kids in, that get care at Boston Medical Center in the six or seven affiliated community health centers that live in Boston Housing Authority housing. And so if you're an accountable care organization, right, you, you own kind of those 10,000 kids for what their health outcomes are, it's kind of a natural partner to be able to go to Boston Housing Authority and say, let's work together. Let's figure out ways of which to, to do this. Um, where I think, um, and this is something that Elizabeth and I talked about in the lobby, the key with the health dollar is there are different versions of it. So there is the health care dollar, which is tied to payer, right, and or provider. There also is this other dollar called the community benefit dollar, which is the amount of um, uh, typically health systems are not for profits. They don't pay money to the IRS on the profits that they make. Um, and so they're supposed to do a commensurate amount of community benefit. Um, of note, the IRS has recently ruled in December of last year that clean and safe housing counts as a community health improvement activity. And so that there are ways now of which that's been, you know, 
put out as a definitive statement. And so now I think there are ways in which you can go at a health system a couple different ways, not only around the health care dollar, which has a very high bar of evidence that sometimes is hard to reach, and then more what I would consider a softer an amount of evidence that this is a community um, health improvement activity and therefore may be important to think about. I wanted to add that there's a lot of um, variability from city to city in terms of housing authority. And in many cities, they are not as um, um, politically motivated, and the infrastructure may not be there. And, and the wonderful thing about what's going on in Boston is it's a great, I think, benchmark and model to achieve. Because I do know that, at least my experience in Baltimore and with other collaborators in other cities, getting a list of addresses and matching them up would not be um, possible. So I, I, it's, the great thing about this is you have kind of proof of concept and it's something to aim for. Um, I have a, a question for Helen. I, um, there was a question earlier about uh, whether staff at Boston Housing Authority uh, became more aware of uh, housing and health issues did you find that in Chicago by working there in the, in the Housing Authority? Is there any evidence that the management and staff maybe gained a little bit of that knowledge? Um, well, I will say, and I don't off the top of my head know the numbers, but CHA is huge. I, so we're talking about a much different um, sized entity than Boston Housing Authority. Um, so scale is much higher. So definitely within the properties that we were working with and within the staff that worked with those properties, we did see um, that sort of an effect. And CHA remains very engaged in continuing to build on the model. And I think ultimately, you know, looking at starting with properties and building in health more comprehensively. So I don't know if I answered the question very well, but um, there's definitely an interest and we've made, we've moved the, the needle, but we're not where Boston is. Any final uh, questions uh, from the audience or the field? Um, I do have one uh, for Megan. Uh, the, uh, I think your study overlapped the implementation um, of smoke-free housing yeah. in Boston. Uh, did you see that in terms of uh, behaviors? Did it look like there was some uh, com compliance was yeah. reasonable? I was going to say, it, um, uh, so you're right. We ran it from uh, 2011 uh, through t like 2014, um, and so uh, it was fully implemented in, in 2012. So there were um, uh, definitely less smoking than on average. So the average in BHA was around 20 percent. We saw at the initial part of the study about 12 percent. Um, I think that what's interesting around uh, smoking in general is is that it is something that more and more when we think about it as an exposure, we have to be really conscious of the intervention that goes along with it, right? And so that one of the things that a um, uh, collaborator at BU School of Public Health, Dan Brooks, has started to put into play is actually place-based smoking cessation, so on-site smoking cessation at the public housing developments. Um, but you end up with that same kind of, in some ways, vicious cycle. The places that do well with that are the places that have good social cohesion that can actually put that into, into effect. Um, uh, I have actually more and more uh, put at the end of my slide decks the what I call the equality versus equity um, slide. And so I didn't put it in this, um, so you're going to have to watch my hands and as I puppet it out. Um, so equality is the concept where you treat everyone the same. And so if you start from different places, which in the, the visualization I like is actually different heighted people trying to reach the apple of opportunity on the tree. And so uh, if you treat everyone the same, the tall person standing on the same size box, the medium height person standing on the same size box, the short person standing on the same size box, the only person that actually reaches the apple of the opportunity is the tall person. Right? In many ways, by treating them equally, you just perpetuate the disparity between all three. You don't actually end it. Whereas equity is the idea of you meet people where they're at and you give them what they need in order to achieve the outcome. And so the tall person stands on, the, on one box. 
The medium height person stands on two boxes. The short person stands on three boxes. And if you do that, all of them reach the apple of opportunity, right? So that you actually have to be okay with treating people unequally in order to get to the equal opportunity. You have to give some people more in order to get there. And I think that more and more we don't um, uh, acknowledge that. I'll end on one other thing. I've seen a version of this slide which is actually heighted people looking over a fence at a baseball game is another way to look at this. I don't like people looking over fences. I like them reaching apples of opportunity. But it's, um, it's interesting. The slide deck is uh, equal, right, where they each have the same and, and only two of them actually get to look over the fence. The short person doesn't get there equity is that they all get the right heighted box in order to look over the fence. And then they have one that's called reality. And reality is where the tall person has seven boxes to stand on. And the medium height person has one to look over the fence. And the short person not only doesn't have a box, they're standing in a hole. Right? And so when we think about that, I do think that's why I start now talking about Boston Housing Authority patients are sick. They are essentially disabled, if not quasi-disabled. You're starting from the whole, right? And so you're starting with buildings that were built in 1939 and haven't gotten, and so you're, I feel like we sometimes, like we wanna reach that apple of opportunity and we're not acknowledging where we're starting from. And so I do think that more and more, um, uh, for those who haven't seen it, the um, I'm very proud to be a pediatrician, um, so, so is Elizabeth. We just put out the Academic Pediatric Association um, has a journal called Academic Pediatrics. We just put out a child poverty supplement, and I wrote the article on, um, with many others, around neighborhood level interventions to lift kids out of um, uh, poverty and into opportunity, and I'd love you guys to check it out. All right, thanks. Okay, what a great way to end. Um, I just want to thank our speakers one more time and, and thank you folks for uh, coming in today. And for those of you who viewed us uh, via the webcast, uh, you know, great discussion. We could have continued for another half hour, but if we had coffee, I guess. <laughs> so uh, thanks again. This uh, uh, webcast will be archived uh, so folks can go back and, and pull it up. Uh, and we'll continue with some discussion up in our office in one of the conference rooms if anybody wants to join us. Thank you. <laughs>